Hey folks, welcome to the Lady K Sailing mini series called Boat 101. Back in the Bahamas, we did a mini-series called Boat How To, and we got some really good feedback. So in this follow-up mini-series, we're talking all about boat basics. We're going to use our experiences to answer the most common questions that we got asked and give you some inside insight into the boating basics from the Lady K Sailing team. Hey guys, this week on Boat 101, we're talking all about winterizing and all the things you should need to know about that. And I know it doesn't apply to everybody. Some of you guys are lucky and you don't have to winterize, but this is still good stuff to know if you're gonna be taking your boat out for long-term storage um, or really anything like that. So let's get started. The first thing we're probably gonna to wanna to talk about and the most important thing when it comes to winterizing is the engine. So where we are, it gets really cold and the water freezes. So number one thing you wanna make sure of is that there's no water in the engine. And it's funny being a boat, the biggest enemy in winterizing is of course water. But before we do that, I wanna talk about oil for a second. And a lot of people don't realize this. The oil in your engine, if it's used oil and you've used it for the whole summer or what have you, um, over the course of the winter, because it's used oil, it starts to gain some acidic properties. And it's no good to leave it in your engine all winter because it's no good for the engine. So the number one thing you wanna do before you haul out for the winter is a fresh brand new oil change. You filter new oil, get that all squared away. That way you have fresh good oil in the engine all winter long uh, and it doesn't become acidic. And then next spring you don't have to worry about it. So it's one last thing. Once you've changed the oil, which we did on Lady K immediately right before we hauled out, once you change the oil, the next thing that we should talk about is your fuel. And this goes, uh, all these things really go for the diesel guys and the gas guys. So if you have an atomic four, all this stuff applies. So fuel, the, the general concept, and people usually think, well, I'll try to use it all and leave it almost empty for the winter. That way, you know, if it goes bad, I'm not out anything. I can just put fresh fuel right on top of it. It'll mix in and I'm fine. Well, that's not actually a very good idea, especially when you live in colder climates where it gets colder in the winter. The reason for that is if you picture your fuel tank, let's say it's half empty, that means half of it is full of air. And with the temperature changing on the outside of the tank, you're gonna get condensation on the outside and on the inside of the tank. And for you diesel guys, um, you're probably already going, uh oh. Um, obviously, if there's condensation, which is water, inside the tank, it's going to drip down and contaminate the diesel fuel and your diesel fuel is gonna have water in it. Huge problem for diesels, of course. Bit of a problem for gas engines too. So the rule is fill your tank completely before you haul out and obviously put some stabilizer if it's diesel you want the anti-gel anti-algae fungus stuff to make sure the diesel doesn't go bad over the course of the winter but you want it full you want barely any air if none at all in that tank for the course of the winter so it doesn't have room air to make condensation hopefully that makes sense the next thing we're going to talk about is winterizing the diesel and we said earlier you don't want water anywhere in the boat if it's going to get cold and go below the freezing point, especially in your engine. So the engine and all of us are all the same. We suck up seawater and we pump it either through the engine or through an exchanger. But either way, we're pumping up seawater, putting it through something to cool the engine and then spitting it out the exhaust. Now, what you wanna do is make sure that entire system is free of water. So the first thing you wanna do is you want to grab one of these guys and this is empty but this is just rv antifreeze good for negative 50 celsius it's cheaper than the green stuff it's always pink um but you're going to save a few bucks getting rv antifreeze and i think it's better for the environment too so that's always a big plus now what you want to do with your engine is you want to figure out where does it get the seawater from now this one on lady k is a little bit different from a lot of boats but all boats are roughly the same there's going to be a through hull or some kind of an intake somewhere below the water line that is sucking up seawater. Lady K has a sail drive, which is like an outboard leg, so that's where it sucks the seawater in. But if you look around an Atomic 4 or whatever your engine is, you'll find somewhere there's a seacock or somewhere that it's bringing in seawater. And the easiest way to do that is to look for your water pump. So on Lady K, the water pump is right here. So pretty straightforward. Um, and it pumps up into the heat exchanger 
through there and then down into the exhaust elbow and then it goes out the exhaust pipe. But where does the water pump get the water from? This is the easy way to figure out where your water is coming from is you just follow the hose on the downside of the water pump. And this one I happen to know, we have it going to a strainer of course because we're in uh, the dismal swamp if you remember and that strainer got full every single day. Um, when this boat was just a Great Lakes boat, it didn't have a strainer and it didn't really matter. So you may not have one. Anyway, from the strainer, it goes around the back and it goes to the leg, the actual sail drive. Um, yours might go to a sail drive or a seacock or to baffles if you're a powerboat guy. It, wherever it goes, it gets water from. Now the trick is we want to pump the pink stuff, the antifreeze, through this line so that the water pump sucks it up, pumps it up, and through all of its chambers... Uh, and pumps and flushes all the water out of the engine. So on Lady K, and, and there's a few ways to do this, on Lady K what we do is I have a shorter hose. So instead of this hose, I have a shorter one that runs just down to the bilge. So what I do is I take off the hose that goes to the leg and I pour a little bit of uh, the pink stuff down that to make sure I wash all the water out of the, the actual sail drive because you don't want it in there either. But now I hook the shorter hose up to the actual water pump and then I take my pink stuff and I put it just here just in the bilge there and I put the shorter hose in the bottle of pink stuff that way when I start the engine and this is kind of a two or three person job you want one person at the engine controls one person to watch the jug because it will suck up this jug very quickly when I did this just a couple of weeks ago it used half this jug in a matter of maybe 30 seconds so you want somebody here to make sure that it doesn't start sucking air. As soon as it sucks air, it's going to burn out the impeller. And an impeller for these motors anyway is like 120 bucks, which I don't want to have to buy an extra one. So um, definitely have somebody watching this. Somebody at the engine controls fires up the engine. And then when we did this, we were actually on the hard up in the cradle. So I also had somebody standing behind the boat with a bucket to catch all the stuff that comes out of the exhaust because it is eventually going to be pressed on or antifreeze whatever you want to call it uh, we don't want that going into the environment we want to dispose of that properly so three people to do it on this boat um, maybe you can figure out a better way some guys hang a bucket over the back on a rope that hangs below the exhaust and that works anyway so you have the short one going into the pink stuff um, and you have a person sitting here watching it and then somebody outside hits the key the engine starts and this was all not in the water we're on the hard so you I mean there's no water to cool the engine Anyway, so it just immediately starts sucking up the pink stuff and it's got water in the system. So it sprays that out the exhaust system. Um, that's fine, but you wanna wait until that exhaust is starting to spew pink stuff. That way you know all of your waters have been flushed out. So the person with the bucket, as soon as they see pink stuff, they say good. And the person at the engine controls shuts it down. Now you've flushed the whole motor, the whole heat exchanger and all the lines going out and you flushed it down through wherever it gets its water we're good to go. No more water in the engine. We don't have to worry about it freezing. And of course, if you have water in the engine and it freezes, it could crack the block or it could crack the heat exchanger or who knows, all kinds of bad stuff. So that's the engine. Okay, we talked about the engine. Next, we're going to talk about the water system in your boat. So here's Lady K's system under this, uh, this bench. And there's her water tank. So what we did with that was um, we were actually plugged into the dock at the time. That way the battery chargers are running. But anyway, it was full. And you're talking about hundreds of liters of water or however many gallons that is. Um, so we just ran all the taps, just turned them all on. Um, the one in the galley and the one in the head. And we ran them until it ran out of water. And as soon as we heard the pump go burr, 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 because it's out of water, we shut the pump off. Once the pump was off, we went ahead and poured another one of those big... These are uh, like five gallon, or no, I guess they're two and a half gallons um, or 10 liters of, of uh, antifreeze. Poured a whole one of these into the water system. Uh, and the idea behind that is there's always going to be a little bit of water in the water system, in the, in the lower tubes that run to the pump and, you know, in the pump probably, uh, and in the accumulator. So who knows, you can never get it all out. So the idea was to pour a lot of that stuff and dilute, dilute it like crazy and then run all of the faucets until they come out pink. And then you know, you got a pretty good chance at not having any problems for the winter because it's so diluted with the pink stuff. Um, and then also leave some in the tank, just in case there's water sitting in the bottom of the tank. You want the tank to have, ours has about two inches of uh, pink stuff in it, um, just at the bottom of the tank to make sure that nothing freezes in the tank and cracks the tank. So that's the water system. All right, let's talk about batteries. 
So I'll show you guys Lady K's batteries. She's a mess right now because uh, it's kind of put away for the winter and I had to put water in all the batteries and I made a big mess. So here they are. Lady K's got four golf carts. So six volt, six volt, six volt, six volt. These two wired together for 12, these two wired together for 12, and both of those into parallel to increase the amp hours. So the one thing you wanna make sure of before you put it away is of course your water level if you have lead acid batteries. And as you can see, these ones are full because I did just fill them. And of course, distilled water, not tap water, distilled water, and make sure they're full. And then the other thing that you wanna make sure of, and, and some people bring their batteries home and that's fine, but you don't actually have to do that. What you have to do if it's gonna be really, really cold is make sure that the batteries are fully charged. A non-fully charged battery, a battery slightly discharged, the cold will actually kill the battery very slowly. But a fully charged battery shouldn't have any negative impact from the cold. So the solar in this boat is still hooked up and it's gonna remain hooked up while the boat's on the hard for the winter. And as you can see, the battery gauge is showing full. Now, of course, there's no fridge running, so full is probably where it's gonna stay. Uh, but occasionally the bilge pump kicks on, every boat gets a little bit of water in it from you know one place or another. So uh, the bilge pump will kick on, use a little bit of juice, the solar will replace the juice. No problem, and we're just gonna leave it like that all winter. Um, and that should be fine, but the batteries need to be charged. Make sure they're fully charged. And if you are worried about it, just bring them home. Okay, now we should talk about the holding tank. Dum, dum, dum. Sorry, Lady K's a mess right now. She's hard to navigate. So, um, this is gonna be a really bad example, but this is the head in Lady K. And as you can see, there's no head. The reason for that is Lady K is equipped with a composting toilet, which we actually took out, cleaned it like incredibly clean, and it's up in the V berth somewhere put away. Um, part of it's right here. But anyway, um, if you have a regular Javsco pump toilet with a, with a holding tank, and we used to, and this is what we did to, to deal with that for the winter, we would go and pump it out, obviously. We have a pump out here where we stay um, when we're not traveling and go and pump it out and then we'd fill the holding tank like half full of water and then pump it out again and then a little bit more water and pump it out again. Um, and then we would shut off the seacock that pulls in water to that toilet, pour a bunch of that pink stuff in the toilet and flush it to flush all the lines going to the holding tank and then pour more pink stuff and flush it again and more pink stuff and flush it again. And sort of the same as the water tank. You want a bit in the bottom that's just the pink stuff and you want to put enough in that it dilutes anything that's still in there, like the water you use to flush it or what have you. So uh, essentially just make sure there's no water in that system, make sure the seacock's closed, and then go ahead and add pink stuff so that it's all pink stuff, so the uh, antifreeze obviously, so it doesn't freeze. Pretty straightforward. All right, so that pretty much covers everything that we do to Lady K. Um, obviously the power's still on, the batteries are switched to off, but there is still power to the um, constant power fuse box that Lady K has. Um, so the bilge pump and that little toilet fan because the nature's head needs a toilet fan. Also, we still have the propane system installed. The propane tank's there. Um, we have the stove um, and the barbecue, of course. Uh, that's still installed and I, I did a lot of reading and stuff and the general consensus is the propane system will be fine. Um, it shouldn't have any negative impact from the cold or anything like that. So I'll let you guys know in the spring if that's not the case. Um, yeah, outside of that, let's talk about uh, building an enclosure over your boat. Now, you could get a custom-made cover like this one. Very nice. It's got elastic in it or a shock cord of some kind. Uh, stays on. Uh, that boat has had that same cover for years and years. A really heavy material. It's got a zipper pocket in the side. So you can get in and out, of course. Uh, really expensive, obviously, that option. You have to have it all custom made for the boat. The other option, obviously, is uh, throw a tarp on it. Um, tie the tarp down. A lot of people will hang water jugs over the side to hold the tarp down. Uh, that way it does have some give in the, in the high winds and things like that. But I want to show you the inside of one of these things because uh, there's a lot of different ways to make a support system inside. You look at this one with a tarp, no support system at all. So you end up with snow and water and ice sort of in the low spots of the tarp. But we'll have a look at uh, Andre's boat. Uh, I believe this is a Sabre, very fast boat, very nice. Now you'll see right away, it's not a custom made tarp. It's sort of a one size fits any 37, 38 footer. 
Um, no problem there, though. I, I want to show you guys the structure inside the boat because he did make the structure and he made it in such a way that it doesn't take on ice and water and things like that uh, very much. And you can sort of modify the structure as you go. So let's go have a look. Alright, so here we are inside the Sabre. Nice boat. Very, very roomy cockpit in these things, and this boat is very, very fast. Um, anyway, so what he did with the structure, and I'll show you from aft to, to bow, is he's got sort of a rig at the back, and then sort of lumber running with another rig here, all the way to the front, and then he's got one in the mast hole, holding it up from there and one on the bow, and then it goes right to the bow rail. Pretty straightforward, but you can see how well the sides are. Really, very unlikely that any snow or ice is gonna build up on these things. He's got a really good pitch on it, and everything should run off really, really easily. Um, he's been using this tarp for a number of years and never had any problems, and it is just tarp material. Now, somebody's sewn some zippers into it, so it's a little heavier than a cheap tarp. It's, you know, more of an expensive tarp. Uh, but really, the, the whole structure is just made with 2x4s, just dimensional lumber. Easy, easy, easy. And uh, he just takes it apart and stores it in a pile of wood, you know, for the uh, for the summer season. So, really cool. He's got a lot of ropes in here, sort of, to support things. Paracord, and then he's got some line up there supporting things. Works really, really well. And, of course, keeps the boat clean, keeps the leaves off, keeps the snow out and the ice out. And then if your boat leaks, like pretty much every boat, you don't have to worry about all the water going into the bilge. Um, the boat just doesn't even get wet. He even left his instruments in. Beautiful. Your lines don't rot. I mean, he spent a couple hundred bucks making something like this. And ultimately, it's going to save you that money in the long run because you're not having to replace things. Nice job with the zipper, too. Pretty cool. Anyway, so that's it. That's winterizing. Um, every boat here has been winterized, of course. Um, and oh, make sure you tie your ladder off. Very good idea. Can't count the number of times I got up in the boat and the ladder fell down. So that's always a good idea. Anyway, he's got the water jugs. Sort of supporting everything. Um, yeah, it looks great. And then I, I think one of the big things that you wanna do when you get it up on the hard um, for the winter or for whatever amount of time it's gonna be on the hard is you wanna kinda go over the problem spots um, rudder blades are a big thing. Um, any hard object, this is just a sailing uh, rigging knife, but nice snappy sound, no water in there. Sounds really good. A lot of guys will actually drill a hole in the bottom of the rudder blade to make sure that any water that does build up inside of it can get out. Um, not really a huge problem, but something to check anyway. And also grab the rudder, move it fore and aft and uh, side to side to make sure that the uh, rudder post is still in good shape. The bearing in there is still in good shape. Um, always a really good idea. Anyway, so uh, that's it for this episode. You can see uh, Lady Kay sitting right here. Still have that Erie Canal smile. So uh, we took a little bit of it off with CLR, but we're going to uh, attack it. Um, in a couple of months when the snow's gone and try to get that off of there and then give her a nice coat of wax before she goes on her next adventure. Uh, but she's in pretty good shape overall. It's funny kind of looking at her now, um, imagining or remembering all the places she's been and all the miles we put on her and all the crazy, you know, things that she's done and weird situations and almost sinking and hurricanes and just to look at her now and think, wow, that boat did that. And she did. Anyway, you'll probably notice I got a ratchet strap over the solar panels. Uh, it's supposed to be 60 knot winds tonight, so that's always a good idea. Uh, anyway, if you guys like this episode, if you find it useful, um, 
hit that subscribe button or give it a thumbs up. That helps us on YouTube, I guess. Um, also, uh, this is all made possible by our patrons. Patreon allows you to send us a couple bucks every Friday when we release a new episode. Uh, that sort of keeps everything going, the camera equipment and you know everything we need to keep doing this. Uh, if you wanna see some more boat how-to or boat 101, throw a comment down below and uh, what your idea is or what you wanna learn about. I have a few other episodes that I've got lined up to get out there, um, but whatever you wanna learn about, go ahead and uh, shoot it down in the comments. We'll see you guys next week.